So I guess we'll wait just another minute or two um, before we get started. What do you think, Lily? Should we get started? Uh -huh, yes. Okay, why don't I go ahead? So um, for those of you that are not from uh, Northern Kentucky University, I want to welcome you to the uh, this episode of uh, the Kentucky Embry uh, uh, Research Seminar that's going to feature folks from um, NKU. In particular, Dr. Drs. Lily Ma and Dr. Brittany Smith will be joining us later. So we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Dr. Ma's talk, but I just want to give a, a brief introduction to uh, for Dr. Ma's talk. And just let you know that she's a professor of biochemistry and chemistry at North Kentucky University. She received her PhD in organic chemistry from Brown University and performed postdoctoral uh, performed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Houston, conducting organic medicinal chemistry uh, research. Her research here is mainly focused on the development of bioactive molecules, with an emphasis on anti-cancer therapeutics. And her research has been supported by grants from Kentucky Embry, the American Chemical Society and an RUI from the National Science Foundation. Today, she will tell us about her latest work on UROC, um, or an undergraduate research in organic chemistry course. So if you put all that together, the acronym gives us UROC. Lily's very um, a very creative there, which is a course-based um, undergraduate research experience uh, in which students in her organic chemistry uh, course uh, develop and characterize novel pharmaceuticals and have presented their work at uh, an original research at regional national conferences. The project has been supported over the last few years by Kentucky Embry Cure Award. So Dr. Ma, thank you for being here today to tell us about your innovative approach to engaging undergraduates in research and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, I'm very happy to be here to talk about our work on the Q Lab, a cost-based undergraduate research lab. Um, well, in this talk, I'm gonna cover the following topics why we changed the curriculum from traditional lab to the Q lab, and uh, how did we select the project? How did we design and uh, implement the project? And uh, our current uh, progress on the research aspect and also on the pedagogical aspect. And uh, finally, I'll talk about the impact, the challenges, and the future directions. Well, traditional organic chemistry lab, they follow cookbook recipe. Students will follow the steps and it's a guaranteed success and uh, there's a very little trial and error. And uh, a lot of times uh, the compounds are being repeated many times. So there's not really real world uh, relevance for those compounds. Some students work really hard. They enter the lab, they got a very pure, very good compounds. And uh, we, we have to toss away the compounds because they have a little value. So the student uh, would ask me, do we really have to throw it away? I said, yes, because not much use for those compounds being repeated so many times already and they well study the compounds. So I'll be thinking if we can give students some research project and they are making interesting molecules and uh, they don't have to throw it away and the molecules might find their application in some medicinal chemistry or biochemistry field. Well, that means to integrate research into the curriculum and uh, this is called a Q curriculum. Uh, it has been, study has shown that uh, learning the current research methods and skills can really increase the student success. So we take this idea and we build three levels of training into our curriculum. On the bottom level, it is uh, the scientific skill, we call it a hard scientific skill, including modern industry standard equipment like uh, infrared and nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, flash chromatography. And also they learn some modern digital tools. This is a technology world and the digital tools are getting more and more important. 
So they're going to learn some drug discovery software and a sign finder and a chemical draw. And uh, the second level, we call the soft scientific skills. This includes scientific communication and a scientific collaboration. On the very top level, we call it science inculturation. Uh, we hope students will develop their persistence, grit, and uh, they are optimistic and their scientific passion through this research project. If you look at the organic chemistry lab, uh, well, students spend about three hours per week in the lab. You take away one midterm, take away one final, they got only 13 weeks. And you times three, this is 39 hours is a lab time. And you actually have to minus the pre-lab lecture. So they got a less than 35 hours of bench top work for the whole semester. 35 hours, not even like a one, one week of full-time student would spend. The full-time student probably gonna spend about 40 hours in the lab during the summer. So this is very limited the time. We in order to get useful things out from the Q curriculum and the student can really feel proud about their work, we need to use a lot of modern instrument to um, assist with this whole progress. The major instrument we used are listed here. We have a micro reactor. This one can finish organic reaction in 10 minutes instead of the traditional oil bath heating for like six hours or three days. And we use uh, automated flash chromatography. Students can set it up and go and come back and pick up the results. Uh, our Q grant was approved and uh, started 2024. And along the years, we acquired a few new instruments and a new software. This is also very important. For example, the benchtop AMR is undergraduate proof and they can get a, a decent AMR of the crude product in five minutes. And we recently, got a new uh, advanced MR, the Booker 500 macros in MR. And this one has amazing auto sampler system. So because it's a new instrument, students can set up the conditions and uh, drop the MR sample and the instrument will run and the results will go to their email box. So they got an instant feedback and instant results, very convenient. And then last year, we acquired a high resolution mass spec, and this will be a new technical training for the student this year. And we also acquired a drug discovery software along the path. Okay, so my research field is medicinal chemistry. So we want to use a, a medicinal chemistry project for the Q lab. It's going to be focused on organic chemistry because the lab is a sophomore organic chemistry lab anyway. They're going to focus on the synthesis, purification, and the calculation. And we want to connect those molecules with the broader aspect. So this Q curriculum will also expand to medicinal chemistry, biochemistry, and physical chemistry. To find a real world research problem for the sophomore lab students is not easy. The biggest challenge is to balance the organic chemistry textbook knowledge and the cutting edge research topic. One side is the well-known chemistry being there for hundreds of years, dozens of years, and the other side is the new chemistry exploring the unknown frontier. So these two have to be balanced very well because this is a lab course, it's a curriculum anyway. Uh, in order to have a clear mind what kind of project we want to use, we have the following four guidelines for the topic selection. We want the topic to be a biomedical relevance that gives the students the real world application sensation. We also want the reaction to be really simple, really feasible for sophomore students. They cannot do too complicated reaction during the three hour bench talk work time. Uh, the mechanism reaction would have a reaction mechanism. The mechanism can be challenging. And uh, this one is uh, actually encouraged because the challenging mechanism will inspire students to think and to correlate their research topic with the lecture knowledge they learned. And also we want the molecule scaffold we picked up will allow various chemical modifications. Uh, this is to um, expand the cure project in the future. We don't have to change the curriculum too much and we can keep the project going for many years. After digging into the literature, we decided to use the tropinol as the scaffold. This is the structure of the tropinol. It's a seven member ring with the nitrogen, with the oxygen. The tropinol compound itself is a very interesting natural product. It has a lot of uh, bioactive derivatives in nature. For example, atropine and cocaine. They are based on tropinol scaffold. 
And then in the laboratory, you can synthesize all kinds of derivatives from tropinone using many different chemistry. Uh, the chemistry we decided to use is called a hydroarylation. It's based on the research we've been working on in the past few years. It uses a new catalyst, a palladium catalyst, to install a hydroaryl piece. Hydroaryl means this fragment has nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, those atoms other than carbon or hydrogen. The common organic scaffold will use carbon hydrogen. So why we choose a hydroaryl fragment? Well, hydroaryl compounds are very important pharmaceutical fragment, and then most of drug molecules or bioactive molecules, they have a hydroaryl fragment. So we think it would be interesting to connect the potential valuable hydroaryl fragment with the potential bioactive tropinol fragment, and then we make this new molecule. And then we have a bunch of molecules uh, run through SciFinder, and we did uh, some uh, background search. And then luckily, there are no research on the uh, structure of the study of those uh, hydroaryl molecules. That means those molecules are really novel and uh, new molecular entities. Well, in terms of pedagogical aspect, the path to the tropinol synthesis has to go through six steps. So mechanism lay is challenging, and all those mechanisms are related to the organic chemistry to lecture content. Well, in the lab, remember there are only sophomore students. In the lab, all the six steps, they happen in the domino fashion. So that means you put the reagents in the reaction flask, the reaction just goes one after another by itself. So it's a one part reaction. So eventually the students do only one step, they can purify and isolate this tropinal compound. And the tropinal compound is used for future hydroarylation reaction. Slider shows the flow chart from the starting material, commercially available starting material to the final purified product. Students will use a microwave set up the reaction, use the automated flash chromography purified, and they use an MR and a high resolution mass spec to characterize the compound. And then sometimes we use the high pressure liquid chromatography to test the purity of the molecules. And then during the spare time of their synthesis, they're going to use uh, software to do this uh, computer modeling and uh, do the drug property prediction. Computer modeling will tell them if their molecule has a good affinity with aromatase. Aromatase is a pharmaceutical target for breast cancer. So we can evaluate if the molecules we designed could be potential breast cancer drug candidates or not. And this ACD perceptor software is the one they can use to predict the drug-like properties. For example, they can predict is the molecule going to be soluble in blood or not? Is the molecule going to be have uh, um, uh, toxicity? Is the molecule going to have a good pharmacokinetic and uh, pharmacodynamic parameters? So this project overall includes the modern instrument and the modern digital software. Well, after we pick up the idea for this project, we developed the curriculum material. It's a 15 week lab material. This table compares the lab technique and experiments in the traditional lab and in the new Q lab. The lines highlighted in the blue color are the new technique included in the Q lab. And you can see, the new Q-Lab allows a lot more instrument and a technical training. And also, because the reaction and the mechanism involved in the Q-Lab, we actually have more contents covered in the Q-Lab compared with the traditional lab. Uh, well, this Q-Lab is for organic chemistry, and we call it undergraduate research in organic chemistry course. If you take the initial, we call it your rock. So I tell students, your rock, you just need the opportunity. <laughs> Uh, after the curriculum being developed, we implement the curriculum in 2020 spring semester. Uh, we have uh, two sections for the spring semester, about uh, 12 students in each section. We hire two teaching assistants for each section because the variety instrument and the software are included. So we need a teaching assistant to help with the students. The students might be on different stage of their research. Uh, will divide students roughly to three groups, the instructor and the two teaching assistants will responsible for one group. So over the past three years, uh, we've been running two sections each spring, and all together, there are about 70 students involved in this uh, Q curriculum, and uh, each student presented their poster. So there are about 70 posters being presented. Uh, the selected posters, I also 
uh, presented at the ACS meetings. We had a virtual and an in-person ACS meeting. Uh, those pictures show the students in the past, and uh, this is a 2020 spring semester. Uh, that was the start of the COVID time. So a lot of classes got continued to online, but uh, we still do the in-person class. We were lucky to get a two lab room for one section, so students were able to spread out. And each student needed to wear a facial mask, a facial shield, and a gloves all the time in the lab. Of course, we keep social distance. So that was a challenging semester, but the students seem to have fun with that. Slide shows our research progress in the past three years. It's a very busy slide, but I'm going to walk you through and uh, highlight the important progress for each year. This year, we focus on the reaction condition establishment and optimization. We test about 20 compounds, and then we use different conditions. We change the catalyst, the palladium, we change the ligand, and then we use a different base. We change the reaction temperature, reaction time, and reaction solvent. So after a bunch of study, we established the initial condition uh, is 170 degrees for 20 minutes. That works for some of the compound. And uh, this is a typical reaction scheme. And uh, this one shows the purification plot of the compound. The first two are starting material. The third one is the side product. The last one is the actual product. And the student isolated this one and ran the NMR. And uh, from the nuclear magnetic resonance, you can see it's a decent MR, give you very clean signal. So the first year, out of the 20 compounds we tested, two compounds were successfully synthesized and purified. There were a few compounds, those compounds in the red boxes, they are very promising. And the rest of the compounds, the reactions failed. So majority of the reaction we tested didn't work. But I tell students, this is okay. This is a research to explore what's feasible, what's not feasible. The second year, we use the condition we optimized from previous year, and then we keep improving the conditions, and we were able to successfully synthesize and purify a few more molecules. So altogether, there are 12 compounds being purified in the past two years. And then also in the second year, we completed the computer modeling for the compounds we proposed. Doesn't matter if they work, they don't work, we can still do the computer modeling. We put our compound into a rheumatoid active site pocket. Uh, aromatase is a pharmaceutical target for breast cancer. And we found out that some of the compounds have really good affinity with the aromatase and they give good docking score. And the pictures are shown here, the red boxes indicate the heme RN chelation. So aromatase active site has an RN atom and the nitrogen from our compound is coordinating with the RN. So that's a strong interaction. The purple boxes indicate this um, hydrogen hydrophobic interaction and uh, the blue box indicates the hydrogen bonding interaction. So all the three interactions contribute to the strong, strong binding between our compound and the aromatase inhibitor. So this is a promising. This means the compounds we synthesized could be potentially anti-breast cancer drug candidates. Well, also in the second year, when we synthesized the molecules, we found some compounds that didn't give the expected structure, like those molecules with the red OH group. OH means a hydroxyl group. So those molecules have been oxidized. It's not a hydrogen in this position anymore. It's become a hydroxide. Uh, well, we because of this, we started uh, um, a collaboration with the physical chemistry lab students. And they calculated the energy level of these molecules. And we try to find a trend if there's any correlation between the energy level and this oxidation state and also those uh, um, binding affinity. Another unexpected thing from the second year is the stereochemistry. When the structure is getting complicated, the NMR also getting complicated. And uh, we were able to see the diastereomers being, pre being produced from our reaction. And then we see different signals from the NMR spectroscopy. So we actually have to use a two-dimensional NMR to characterize those molecules. 2D NMR is a graduate school level technique. But uh, in this QLab class, because of the need of the research, students were introduced uh, with this uh, concept and uh, with the interpretation of the 2D AMR, and uh, they feel very proud of that. Well, in year three, that is the current year, we have uh, 20 compounds uh, planned. Some of the compounds are repeating compounds because we didn't get a good enough spectrum from previous run. Some of the compounds are new compounds, and we try to use a different substrate and test different conditions, and let's say can solve the mystery from previous year. And also in the third year, we initiated our bioassay study. 
we use uh, enzyme fluorescent uh, test kit from Epcam. And uh, research students actually were trained to do the enzyme assay. And we tested the uh, QLab student compounds and some of the compounds showed the promising results. So we have one example shown here. It looks like a decent uh, curve that gives you the IC50, the inhibitor inhibition number of those compounds to the aromatase. Those research results have been uh, presented by students in poster format at uh, many events. All the students are required to attend the end of the semester mini symposium. And uh, we have uh, two examples here showing the student work. And uh, last year, the mini symposium, we were able to host it in the sciences, sciences center of Fosswell. We provide food and a drink. So it's a very relaxing and enjoyable environment to talk about uh, science. And uh, some students even brought a uh, guitar to provide some music entertainment. Well, other events for students to present their research results include NKU celebration, the IDEA conference, regional or national IDEA conference, and also American Chemical Society national meetings. What I want to point out is the teaching assistants. They are so excited about this curriculum. They did a great work to supervise the students and assist the students with their research progress. And they volunteered at the end of the semester to present a poster. And they said that they can provide a poster and uh, provide uh, some information from teaching assistants perspective about the QLab progress. Well, we have uh, three levels of training um, incorporated into this uh, QLab course. And uh, we do a lot of survey for the QLab students. Uh, before the class, they do a pre-course survey. After they do post-course survey, and uh, they also have uh, a lot of different <coughs> feedback throughout the semester. And we give the survey to QLab students and also the traditional lab students with the traditional lab students as the control data. Well, how the survey results. At NKU, we collect, uh, we use Quadrix to collect the raw data for the survey. And then we send it to UK Department of Statistics. Dr. Greg Hawk was able to plot the data for us. And uh, here you see it's the result from the past two years. The blue line representing the QLab student response, and the red line representing the traditional lab student response. And the percentage means the students, they respond very or extremely effective uh, about their improvement in technical skills. And uh, from this uh, spider plot, you can see the overall trend, the QLab students reported uh, more improvements than the traditional lab students. And uh, a few big improvements I highlighted on this PowerPoint slide, the drug discovery software, QLab reported the 60% more improvements compared with the traditional lab, sign finder 50% more, and then nuclear magnetic resonance 30% more, and a uh, macro reactor, Rotovap 30 to 40% more. And then uh, we have a picture showing the QLab students doing this uh, nuclear magnetic resonance training in the lab. A set of skills we are hoping to uh, train the students is called a software scientific skills. And uh, this one includes scientific communication and uh, some interpersonal skills. And uh, we give the lab to QLab, we give the survey to QLab students and uh, control group. And uh, according to the, um, this plot, the biggest improvement we can see is the skills in presenting, a, in giving a presentation because all the QLab are required to present a poster at the end. So they report a 66% improvement in their skills in giving a presentation. And it also reported a become a part of the learning community for QLab students is 95%. So it's 25% uh, higher than the traditional lab students. They also, uh, the QLab students also reported a high percentage for the management skills. Well, communication, management, planning, organization, and teamwork those are non-technical skills. But according to a career chemist, those are the four important non-technical skills, for, very important for career success. So QLab students reported the similar or higher improvements in those non-technical skills. Now the last level of this uh, training is scientific enculturation. So this is not easy to, evaluate, we just put um, questions 
to the lab students before and after the lab, and we compare the Q lab and the control lab students as as best as we can. On the left side, you can see that's the result for the Q lab and the pre lab students before they taking the organic chemistry two class, and you can see the results very similar. They almost overlap. On the right side, on this plot, you can see the blue line, the QLab students have a dramatic improvement after taking the QLab. So this is a post-lab results, post-cause survey results. And then correspondingly, the control lab students reported the lower percentage in those uh, uh, questions we evaluated. The top two ones are the student-driven project. QLab students reported 25% more and uh, to handle the ability to handle a project with the unknown outcome, the lab students reported 25 percent more. This is a more detailed uh, survey asking about uh, some uh, questions about uh, their um, scientific perception and uh, their confidence in science. So compare the Q lab, which is the blue line, with the control lab, which is the red line. You can see overall the Q lab reported the higher percentage. And uh, the few categories reported a very obvious, uh, the few categories has dramatic, has obvious improvement. I highlighted with the green arrows. And we can see the QLab students reported a higher percentage for understanding research progress, for integrating theory and practice, for their ability to tolerate uh, obstacles, and uh, for their uh, clarification or career path. And their confidence in scientists, in scientists' potential has increased. And then the last one, you can see the QLab students, which indicated by the blue line, has a lot of higher, uh, a much more, a much higher percentage uh, reported. They feel they are better prepared for postgraduate goals. So overall, we can see the new curriculum, the Q curriculum, it does have a lot of impact on students. They build students' hard, soft scientific skills, and they help students with their scientific traits, and also they um, teach students chemistry knowledge, help them to become a learning community and getting them ready for their career, career future career goals. And what you can know is the, uh, our curriculum. Our QLab curriculum has a unique feature. We use original research. So that means the research results from the lab students are publishable. And they're going to add a new knowledge to the medicinal chemistry field because they're making new molecules, potentially new drug entities. They're also going to add a new knowledge to organic chemistry field because of palladium chemistry and the hydroaeration are essentially new reactions. And we use a microwave, which is a green chemistry technique. The compounds the students synthesized are collected and they become part of our new rock compound library. And uh, those compounds will be uh, continue the in future study in house or through external collaboration. Well, through the years we run the QLab, we realized that there are some challenges and we think about uh, uh, future directions. Uh, the first three challenges are from student perspective. Some students report the lab and the lecture are not strictly related. Uh, this is because the research topic, you have to go really deep not like a traditional lab, you can go broad and do one different experiment each week. Well, a potential solution for this uh, problem is to expand the post-lab and the discussion questions. We can point out the connection of the research topic in the QLab with the lecture content they covered in the class. The second one is the limited instrument time. A lot of times students try to fight for one major instrument. So I've been offering flexible lab starting time. They can start early, so you don't have to all jump to the same instrument at the same time. And then the first four weeks are packed with the lab skill training. You can see there are a lot of instruments and software involved. And there's a training all done in the first four weeks. So a little bit overwhelming for students. So one thing we can do is to enhance the pre rec class, the Organic Chemistry 1 lab class. And we've already been doing that. We've been putting part of the NMR training and the science funder training into the three time lab. And uh, this year, we see the students have better understanding about those techniques. When they move to the Q lab, it's much more smooth the transition. So three challenges are from instructor's perspective. 
uh, we needed to uh, hire and uh, train the TA. The TA needed to know all the instruments, all the softwares. So the recent TA has been recruited from the research students because they've been trained uh, very well on the instrument to use. And also the instructor need to have a, a immediate feedback on the research progress. The students, uh, they work on their own molecule, but the whole class collaborate together and uh, through different sections, they collaborate together. So the instructor needed to uh, have an instant feedback for all the students. That means a timely grading and a timely discussion with the students and give the feedback of the progress of the two sections to the class. And this one is a cost for the lab supplies. The QLab are known to be expensive because you have to buy the chemicals, buy the supplies to support the research project. It is essential a research project. So this one you just have to publish the paper and apply for future funding to support the Q program. And uh, lastly, from the department perspective, uh, if we look to um, future direction to expand the QLab to more sections, that would include uh, um, more instructors. So instructor probably will also need to be trained with the techniques and uh, also include a um, supervisor to coordinate and synchronize all the different sections because the progress is for the whole project. And we need to give the progress back to the students so they know what to do for the next step. Okay, so lastly, I would like to thank the QLab students and the teaching assistants for their hard work. And I would like to thank the co-PI on this grant for their input. And I would like to thank our chemistry department for their strong support to run the QLab program. I also would like to thank our collaborator, uh, Drs. Greg Hawk and uh, Dr. Stromberg from UK. They did a statistical plotting for us. And uh, Dr. here, Dr. Shalisa from the PCAM lab, they've been helping the PCAM uh, students with the computer, with the Gaussian calculation for the molecules we've been synthesizing. The funding for this project comes from a uh, Kentucky Inbury Q grant and the NKO CNSM soccer grant. Uh, the preliminary results for this uh, Q lab, that means the palladium chemistry part, was supported by National Science Foundation. Thank you, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Lily. That was an awesome talk. Um, it's just, I think that's an exemplar for how to um, perform a cure and the data was really compelling there. So thanks so much. So do folks have questions? Mm -hmm. You wanna unmute yourself and ask a question? You can go ahead. We probably have time for maybe one or two. So I haven't heard any yet. So Lily, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yes. How do you actually train the TA? So they're in your research lab. Do they have to do any additional training to actually work with the organic chemistry lab? And also, do you pay them or do they get course credit? How are they kind of reimbursed for the time? Yeah, so the research students, they already trained with the lab instrument and a digital tool technique. So I only train them about the teaching assistant part. That means to teach them how to supervise the lab and uh, how to do this uh, like a part of the pre-lab lecture and that how, how to have an interaction with the students, instant feedback and instant troubleshooting. So it's more on the TA perspective. There are technical parties are they fine. Yeah, the TA are paid because the TA has to be there in the lab during the lab time, there's no excuse. So taking credit of volunteer teachers, volunteer teaching assistants sometimes not guaranteed. They might have something jump up, they might have some other obligations. So when I apply this grant, I have a, budget for the teaching assistants. So both teaching assistants are paid through the semester. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> are there any other questions? So I think we perhaps should move on at this point. So Lily, thanks again so much for that talk that was really illuminating and very compelling. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. So I think we're ready to go on to Dr. Smith. I'm gonna ask folks if you're not uh, asking a question, can everybody please check to make sure they're um, on mute, because I think we have a couple of people that are not on mute right now. So um, so I'm assuming that uh, Dr. Rogers is still on Zoom here and will uh, get us to, um, to Dr. Smith's slides. Whitney, is that true? Yeah, one second. I think Lily might need to stop sharing. Let me see if I, okay. can, let me see if I can make her stop. I think Brittany got it. 
Yeah, I clicked the share button. It said it was loading. So I think I was just waiting. OK, good. So while you're loading the rest of it there, Brittany, I just want to give a brief introduction. So Dr. Brittany Smith is our next speaker. She's an assistant professor of psychological science at NKU. She received her PhD in neuroscience from the University of Cincinnati and performed postdoctoral research there in developmental neuroscience as well. Um, Dr. Smith's research uses mice as a model organism to ascertain the cognitive molecular effects of prenatal op opioid exposure on offspring. Her work is currently supported by a Kentucky Embry Faculty Startup Award, as well as a five-year K-99 Career Development Award uh, from NIH. So Dr. Smith, thanks so much for your willingness to talk today about your work on this important project, and I'll let you take it from there. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to speak to everybody today on my work on offspring cognitive and social behavior after prenatal opioid exposure. So as Mark said, I'm a neuroscientist here in the Department of Psychological Science at NKU. I am in my second semester at NKU, so still fairly new, and I'm in the process of setting up the neuroscience lab at NKU. So the data that I will be presenting today is exclusively conducted when I was a postdoc at the University of Cincinnati, but I also included uh, my plans to pursue this line of research once the lab is set up, which I'm hoping should be towards the end of the spring semester and then during the summer. Uh, I was awarded a project grant, an internal project grant, and so I'll, I'll talk about that idea that I, that I uh, that was currently funded as well, which is what I plan to do this summer. So my lab as a whole is interested in this association between an adverse prenatal environment and neurodevelopmental disorders in the offspring. And so one of the proposed mechanisms for this association has been these prenatal adversities that have the capacity to induce an immune response in the mother or and, and that immune response can transfer via the placenta to induce a immune response in the fetus, or the substance can diffuse directly through the placenta and cause the fetus to originate its own immune response. So there are multiple routes to initiate this immune response, which we think that this adverse environment can have the capacity of an amplified effect on the fetal immune system. This can affect how the brain is developed because these immune cells in the brain called microglia are very active during the neurodevelopmental period. They interact with neurons in the brain to form how the brain is essentially wired. And so it is proposed that these prenatal adversities that have the capacity to induce immune response can affect how these brain cells interact, increase this risk of neurodevelopmental disorders in the offspring. And I'm a behavioral neuroscientist, so I am mainly focused on measuring these outcomes via impaired behavioral function. And so the association in humans, we see that there is this increased risk of neurodevelopmental disorders after prenatal adversity. And this risk really does seem to have a sex dependent effect where males appear to be more vulnerable or more likely to have these neurodevelopmental disorders associated with the prenatal adversity, such as autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, and even dyslexia, stuttering, and Tourette's. So my research goals are twofold. One, to evaluate whether this is a causal association. So move beyond it just being associated with the emergence of neurodevelopmental disorders, but is there something on the neurobiological end that is causing this to occur? And if so, how? I've got current grant funding to study prenatal opioid exposure. This is motivated by the opioid epidemic and an unfortunate consequence of that is an increase in pregnant women using opioids while they are pregnant. Currently, this exposure is captured largely by the incidence of what is called this neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome or NOWS. NOWS is when a baby has been exposed to opioids in utero and when they're born, they go through opioid withdrawal as a neonate. And so this typically requires a NICU hospitalization and extended treatment to taper off of an opioid. And so currently the NOWS rate is at 7.3 per 1,000 births across the US. However, more concerning, this represents an 82% increase in the last decade. 
We see these sex differences emerge with NOWS diagnosis. Males are more likely to be diagnosed with NOWS, indicating that this prenatal exposure could increase male vulnerability. And most concerning of all, we did a study that captured opioid exposure via confirmatory testing where we took maternal urine samples and did mass spec to look for opioid metabolites. And when we did this confirmatory testing, we found that the exposure rate was 10 times that of the hospitalization rate for the withdrawal syndrome. So this exposure, which we think is the most problematic portion of it, not just the withdrawal, the exposure is 10 times larger of a problem than it is currently measured. And as a neuroscientist, I'm interested in how this affects the developing brain. And so we see that the, these two brain regions called the prefrontal cortex and amygdala have this enhanced developmental sensitivity to opioids. So in exposed children via MRI studies, we see an increased connectivity between these two brain regions from infancy all the way to early adolescence. So this is observed early on and does not dissipate over time. Prefrontal cortex is largely responsible for cognitive control, while the amygdala is responsible for emotional reactivity, and then the connection between these two brain regions governs a lot of social behavior. So executive function as a whole, which is largely mediated by the prefrontal cortex, is important for goal-directed action, so adjusting your behavior accordingly to accomplish your goals. It's also important for self-regulation, so impulse control and emotional control. Overall, this cognitive control or executive function is instrumental for learning and overall life success. And importantly for my research question is these deficits in cognitive control are hallmarks of a number of different neurodevelopmental disorders. So rather than trying to study features of any one particular neurodevelopmental dis disorder, by studying executive function, this is relevant to a number of different neurodevelopmental disorders. So think of cognitive control as essentially the driver of your behavior. Then we have emotional reactivity and social behavior, which is governed by the amygdala and then its connections with the prefrontal cortex. These relate to cognitive control because positive emotions can en enhance cognitive control while negative emotions can break it down. And then inappropriate social interactions may indicate a loss of cognitive control demonstrating how these two brain regions are highly interconnected. So in the analogy of the cognitive control executive fun function being the driver, this emotional reactivity is illustrated by even road rage and other people can distract even a great driver. So you may have appropriate cognitive control, but if this emotional reactivity is not in check, it can be distracted. So we see that prenatal opioid exposure is indeed associated with behavioral problems in the offspring and the children as they develop, and this manifests as both problems with cognitive control and emotional and social regulation. So we see executive function problems in attention, hyperactivity, impaired inhibitory control. We also observe impaired emotional control and problems with social behavior. What's important is that a lot of these behavioral problems manifest with or without a knowledge diagnosis, so it's not just the withdrawal that the infant goes through at birth, it's the exposure, which as I mentioned before, is currently 10 times more prevalent than we have previously estimated. So moving towards my research goal, we see this association across numerous studies, but why hasn't causation been determined? Why am I continuing to study this? Well, in the opioid using population maternally, there's a number of different confounds that we cannot separate from this population. So in mothers who use opioids and also use nicotine as, as high as 60 to 95% of women who are using opioids also use nicotine or other substances. These children may be born to a very unstable home environment. The mother may have, have comorbid psychiatric illness and high, high levels of stress, which have been known to affect offspring cognitive development and social development. And the mother is also more likely to be uh, exposed to hepatitis C. So what can we do? In my training as a neuroscientist, I have expertise with rodent models. So I have developed and used a rodent model to study this, to eliminate these confounds to determine, determine causation. 
So using mice, we do this maternal morphine exposure model where we take mouse mothers called dams and we randomize them to receive either morphine or saline throughout gestation. We start the treatment one week prior to pregnancy to model the initiation of opioid use prior to pregnancy. We continue it all the way through birth while the mother is lactating to avoid opioid withdrawal while she is caring for her pups until the pups are weaned on postnatal day 21. So the mother is injected daily. The pups are never treated with the opioids. So this is an exclusive maternal exposure model. Then we investigate social behavior and executive function in the adolescent and adult offspring. And so we propose that if this exposure is causal, it will cause this impaired cognitive function and social function. And we study this in offspring of both sexes because another hypothesis is this, this may be more emerging in male offspring. And my second goal is how does this occur? So I'm also interested in neuroimmunology. And as I said, these brain immune cells are heavily involved in neurodevelopment. And so these brain immune cells called microglia, I propose play a role in mediating this potential causal relationship. And the evidence that supports my hypothesis for this is that opioids activate what's called the toll-like receptor 4, TLR4, on microglia to initiate an inflammatory response. So morphine binds to the mu opioid receptors to have its effect on the, on the body to mediate pain relief and the feelings of euphoria. However, it can also cross bind with this TLR4 to initiate activation of these microglial cells or immune cells. When they're activated, they increase the expression of this complement receptor 3 or CR3 protein on their processes. From a de developmental neuroscience perspective, this CR3 activation of microglia is important because during development, microglia have been shown to prune synapses during development via this CR3 protein interacting with C1Q on neurons. So microglia that express CR3 can be attracted to neurons and actually eat this material on a neuron to shape how responsive that neuron is later in life. And interestingly, this microglia mediated pruning is more evident in males. So males use this system more heavily than females do during development. In addition to this, a recent work published by Carolyn Smith has shown that, uh, this is a different Smith, not me, but um, that prenatal opiate exposure may actually impair pruning of microglia. So adulthood exposure to the opioid can um, increase this activation of microglia via TLR4. However, we see when we do it developmentally, the opioid actually may impair their ability to prune, so cause this microglia deficit during development. So I hypothesize that this prenatal opioid exposure may impair behavior via microglia deficits. And so when we did this study in the morphine versus saline treated dams, we study the offspring, we look at social behavior via a variety of different tests, and we use this five choice serial reaction time test to look at executive function. Then we collect brain samples for gene expression and look at microglia under the microscope. We study social behavior via free social interaction. We look at social, non-social, dominant, and submissive behaviors. And then we also use this three-chambered social interaction test test where a mouse is exposed to either a social social stimulus or a non-social stimulus and we track their preference and then we can also look at novelty if they remember that same familiar mouse or if they engage in socializing with a new mouse. We study executive function via this five choice zero reaction time task. This is the gold standard for studying executive function in mice. They we do this in a touchscreen platform where they go into this chamber and there's this five touchscreen ar array. One of the five touchscreens will illuminate, the mouse has to pay attention and touch that screen to collect a food reward from the back of the chamber. The task is set up like this. There's an inter trial interval where the mouse has to wait for the stimulus light to come on. The stimulus light then comes on, they have to pay attention and press the correct screen to get the food reward. We can look at executive function in this test because there's 
inner trail interval where they have to withhold responding. If they don't wait and make a response, this is a premature or impulsive error. So we can look at cognitive control and impulse control here. We can look at just response accuracy. Are they, are they, do they have the cognitive capacity to learn the task? And then the stimulus is finite, so they have to be paying attention and it will end. So if they make an omission, that is an inattentive error, deficit in attention. And we train the mice on this task first by doing a fixed ratio one, where they just use this center screen to just learn. Pressing a screen gets them a reward. So we can look at very basic learning there. Then we move into progressive ratio where we assess motivation by increasing the number of responses required to get that same reward. And we measure what's called break point, the point at which they stop responding to get a reward, uh, the number of responses where they deem it's no longer worth it to get that reward. And then we move into the five choice zero reaction time task. It's a very full battery of cognitive testing to get towards this executive function in mice looking at prefrontal cortex function. So we found is that male, male morphine exposed offspring, prenatally exposed have reduced motivation in progressive ratio. And then in the five choice serial reaction time task, our male offspring that were exposed have decreased accuracy in the five choice task during acquisition of the task and during testing. And then they also have increased omissions or increased inattentive behavior in the acquisition portion of the task. We found that the females were largely unaffected on these outcomes. When we looked at social behavior, we found that the male morphine exposed offspring have increased social and exploratory behavior. So this is a free social interaction, they spend more time being social. And they also have a stronger preference for a social counterpart versus an object. We also looked at exploratory behavior in this open field task. We measured how much they venture out from this safe perimeter into the center of an open field, and the male morph morphine exposed offspring were more exploratory in this task. Again, females much less affected. So this gets at behaviors that may involve the amygdala. So together we did find that prenatal morphine exposure affects male cognitive and social function. We see after this exposure, they have increased sociability, which may be seen as a good thing, but it almost seems to come at the expense of cognitive function. We've done this study again, looking at different doses of morphine, and we do find that the, the sex differences are dose dependent, where at higher doses, females may become more vulnerable, but males are more vulnerable at the lower dose. So that gives evidence that, yes, this is a potentially causal relationship with, when we isolate all the confounds that we see in the human population, we observe this cognitive and social impairments in the offspring in a mouse model. So how? Looking at the role of microglia. So this is the work that I've just begun to put together and plan on testing further. So we see that prenatal morphine exposure increases expression of microglia-related genes early in the postnatal period. So early on in life or development, we see increased CLR4 expression in the amygdala on postnatal day one. We see increased expression of this MyD88 CLR4 adaptive, adaptive protein in the prefrontal cortex on postnatal day 21 and then increases in this complement receptor three, which is in, involved in eating synaptic material in the prefrontal cortex and amygdala and postnatal day one. And this is sustained in the prefrontal cortex and postnatal day 21. So we see early signs of activation of these brain immune cells. However, by adulthood, this dissipates, dissipates and even de decreases. When we looked at the adult offspring, we did microscopy to actually examine what these cells could be potentially doing. We looked at two protein markers under the microscope. One of them is the CD68, I'll call the eating protein. It's involved in these microglia eating different debris. So they're immune cells, they usually clean up debris so they could be eating a variety of different things. And then this IBA1 label, which is in the cyan colored, which is a moving protein. So it's involved in cell motility. So you can see it nicely outlines the cell. And what we found was when we measured these proteins, we saw a reduction of the eating protein in the amygdala of the adult male offspring and a reduction of the eating protein in the prefrontal cortex of the adult male offspring, indicating a possible deficit in 
I don't know if it's pruning because I don't know what they're eating yet, but a deficit in them eating something. However, in females, we actually saw an increase in this protein. So sex dependent difference that tracks with our behavioral phenotype that we see. So microglia are eating, possibly eating less, but of what? So we also did when I was a postdoc, we did had the opportunity to do the single cell gene expression where we dissociate the different cells of the brain. So you can see there's a bunch of different categories of cells in the brain. We've got eight of them listed here. And when we look at gene expression, we usually mash them all up together. And so we don't know what genes are being expressed differently in what cells. This single cell gene expression technique is extremely expensive, but allows us to look at that. So when we isolated by cell type and looked at what, what cell type do we see the most change via from this prenatal morphine exposure. So we did this in adult males versus adult, adult male morphine versus saline offspring. And we found that inhibitory neurons were actually had the greatest number of differentially expressed genes. Inhibitory neurons are important because they have what's called, there's a class of them that have this perineuronal net or PNN. This PNN, as you can see here, surrounds a one class of inhibitory neuron, and they're developmentally very sensitive to prenatal adversity. And this is a link to possibly what microglia may be eating. So microglia can eat perineuronal nets to control brain function. And then there's evidence saying that in adults, in adult animal models, opioids can perturb the interaction between microglia and paraneuronal nets. However, we haven't looked at this opioid exposure prenatally. So my question now is, does this prenatal opioid exposure disrupt microglia and paraneuronal net interactions? So my future directions are to test this hypothesis that the prenatal morphine exposure causes this microglia deficit, which may relate to this increased sociability in cognition. So if you have a deficit in microglia, we may have an excess of these paraneuronal nets leading to an altered circuit in the amygdala and or prefrontal cortex. So my plans for the summer is to look at restoring this possible microglia deficit by giving a compound that stimulates the growth of microglia and then testing whether this restores the sociability and cognitive function of the offspring up to the levels of the unexposed controls. My question, if we stimulate microglia, will that restore this behavioral function? So overall, we see that this prenatal opiate exposure may cause behavioral changes via micro, microglia deficits. So we see this impaired cognitive function and this excess sociability, which I don't know if it's really impaired social function, it's just elevated, but it may relate to cognitive function. I have separate ideas to assess that as well with this increased male vulnerability. And then follow up on this work, I plan to get deeper into the how this may be occurring, possibly via early microglial activation and later deficit in pruning, possibly, of these paraneuronal nets. I'd like to thank Northern Kentucky University for me being able to find a home for my, my work and in the, in the Department of Psychological Science has been extremely supportive and, and just I've enjoyed getting to know everyone as colleagues and thank the Kentucky Enbrae New Faculty Startup Award that has enabled me to get going on getting the lab set up to continue this work. I'd like to thank my K99 R00 Award, my training committee at Cincinnati Children's for that. And then all of my former trainees at, at UC, so I had a number of undergraduates that helped with this project, project Alex and Tess are on the paper that we just recently published on this. And then my postdoctoral mentor, Teresa Reyes and her lab that has been extremely supportive. And then of course, we've got um, single cell RNA sequencing core, Sean Smith and Frank Wang that helped with that. And then the Woolab lab at the University of Cincinnati that helped with the CD68 labeling. I think I'm right at time. Brittany, thanks so much. That was a very eloquent um, walk through some uh, really uh, interesting research there. So I'll open up for questions. We have a couple minutes left here if anybody wants to ask a question. 
Hey, Brittany, uh, nice, nice presentation. I'm at home. So if you hear my kids screaming, I apologize. Mine but are doing my, the same thing. So <laughs> my uh, mother in law just got into town. So they're super hyped up. So I had to go to the basement. Um, I do have one question. It's about the five choice cell reaction time data. So I have mm -hmm. a lot of background in impulsivity. So what I was really interested in is if you look at these mice that are, you know, pre exposed to like an opioid. You know, if these animals are having increased omissions, are these omissions like scattered throughout the session or is it just that they earn their food and in the last part of the session they're satiated and they just stop responding, which could also account for like why they're less motivated. Mm. So is it really just like a motivation aspect or is it just like the prenatal exposure has done something to them that makes them not as hungry? Um, so data that I didn't show that might indirectly answer that question, we also see um, a reduction in impulsive errors. So to me, that suggests that they're like truly not paying attention. Um, and we see that there's like this level of impulsivity that tracks really well with the number of correct responses. So I do think that that like a certain number of impulsive errors like helps them do the test correctly. And so they do have decreased impulsive errors as well. Although we haven't looked like across the session and the, the amount of reward they get, I would, we've measured is, is very minimal and shouldn't be enough to state them. And they don't accumulate really like enough correct responses to then just like start giving up. Okay. Like they, when we look at the data, like their correct responses are typically lower. Okay. But then I was good. gonna ask, like, just the type of reinforcers they earn. I'm imagining they're like caloric, not like isocaloric type reinforcers. They're they get chocolate yoohoo, so it's like okay. <laughs> like chocolate water, <laughs> and it's like a very <laughs> tiny amount. It's like ten microliters per. Yeah. Like it's it's extremely small amount. Okay. Cool. But yeah, that's a good question. Are there any other questions out there? Hi, Brittany. Um, it's Chris. Um, so I'm so glad that you came to NKU and um, <laughs> got to work with one of my former students when she went over to UC for the SURF program. Yes. Um, if I remember right, you use a, a unique genetic model, some kind of cross. Yes, we um, do do a cross. Yes, yes. And so we Oh, go ahead, Ali. No, I was just wondering um, what you're able to look at versus um, those that are using more traditional strains. What advantage do you see in those crosses? Um, I don't know if it's an advantage. We, uh, my first line is that it increases the genetic diversity of our offspring population, so it's more generalizable. Um, and logistically, it makes it almost more difficult because we always have to purchase like new well then when we go to do transgenics I, I think logistically it may be difficult um but what is interesting and we, we we do a c57 black six dam crossed with a dba male sire um and that was the model that we had used in the lab before i started the opioid work so i, I used to work with uh maternal high fat diet and how that affected offspring cognitive function so we wanted to kind of keep the same model system. Um, but we actually found out as I was doing the study that um, there's been studies looking at these two strains and the C57 black six strain is one of the highest morphine preferring strain, whereas DBA is like the has the lowest preference for it. So it could potentially be like a genetically high preferring mother with a genetically low preferring father, but we haven't really done much on the strain, but I think it does introduce some variability to what we observe because they are genetically more diverse. So we have to have a larger sample size. Yeah, I was wondering, because um, those two mice, we were actually talking about them in our lab meeting this morning, have different versions of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And we've noticed that one, the B6 are less anxious and the, the ones with the other um, allele uh, tend to have a higher anxiety. And I didn't know if um, what the heterozygotes would look like. Um, 
there is there is something very interesting with how they metabolize the drug. So if you inject a C57 black six with morphine, it causes them to be hyper locomotive. So they will endlessly pace around their cage like nonstop, like their little like mouse wind up toys. That's the C57 black six as a high morphine preferring strain. If you inject a DBA with it, they turn into like sloths. They like stop moving. And the crosses also do the same thing. We tried to look at like locomotor behavior and and five choice zero reaction time task performance after like a morphine challenge in the offspring and they just they turn into little sloths and they like stop moving so i think there is something different with how those two strains metabolize the drug because it's like immediately apparent by their behavior after they're injected with it all right so we're over time so if you have questions i'm sure you can email uh either dr ma or dr smith or you can let me know and I'll get it to it. So I want to thank our uh, speakers once again, and thank you for all attending today and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you both.